Welcome to Reels on the Rocks, the show where your hosts, Whiskey and Sweet Tea, discuss film from the unpretentious perspective. Today's episode, we discuss the absolute classic 1970s airport. Please be advised, spoilers are ahead. Hey listeners, welcome to July, it's Blockbuster Month, the second annual... Um, so this month we have one of my absolute favorites, 1970s, the granddaddy of disaster films, Airport. Uh, so I'm going to go right into, there's a lot of people and stuff going on with this one. So I'm just going to go right into our stats. So we have Airport 1970 based on Airport by Arthur Haley, uh, which is a book. Uh, it was directed by George Seaton, and it was also written by George Seaton. The music is by Alfred Newman. Costumes are by Edith Head. Cinematography is by Ernest Laszlo. We have starring in this role, we have some big names here. Burt Lancaster as Mel, Dean Martin as Vernon, Jean Seberg as Mrs. Livingston. Her, I think her first name is actually Tanya, but I don't think it's really said. Jacqueline Bissett as Gwen, the flight attendant. George Kennedy as Petroni. Helen Hayes as Ada Quonset. We have Van Heflin as, uh, oh my God. <laughs> I see I started I got way too into this I'm so excited you guys can tell that he is a big fan of this one because he's talking a mile a minute <laughs> basically we have Van Heflin in his final film role as oh my god I know it's not Guillermo but I want to say Guillermo it's uh, Guerrero <laughs> and oh then, wow that was his final role that was his well his final film role I think he did some TV work after this this is also I guess you could say he went out with a bang oh <laughs> <laughs> bad joke but i love it this is also alfred newman's final scoring role and then we also had the starring maureen stapleton as inez guerrero uh so this one was up for quite a bit of oscars it had 10 nominations at the academy awards and one win it was up for best picture best supporting actress for both helen hayes and maureen stapleton helen hayes took home the oscar uh, best screenplay, and I love how lengthy these names used to be. Best screenplay based on material for another medium. So that was the precursor to adapted screenplay. Best art direction, best cinematography, best costume design, best film editing, best original score, best sound. Uh, at the British Academy Film Awards, which was the precursor to the BAFTAs, it had one nomination for best actress in a supporting role. I believe that was for Miss Maureen Stapleton. It had four well, nominations. So which which Academy Award did it win? It won for Best Supporting Actress for Helen Hayes. Okay. Golden Globes, it had four nominations and one win. It was nominated for Best Motion Picture, Drama, Best Supporting Actor, George Kennedy, Best Supporting Actress, Maureen Stapleton. It took home the Globe for that. Best Original Score, it was nominated for two Grammys and one win uh, for Best Original Score written for a motion picture or television special. And Best uh, instrumental composition for the airport love theme and it won the grammy for that it was up for one writers guild of america nomination for best drama adapted from another medium uh there were some other award shows that it was up for i didn't necessarily recognize them off the top of my head but it did have some other awards out there um so getting right into this this is one of my absolute favorites I, 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 I couldn't just, tell. <laughs> this is just, this is a movie I could watch again and again. So first off, I know this is, you went into this blind. I'm eager to hear what your first impressions were uh, after your first don't, viewing. Don't kill me, T. Uh, I accidentally uh -oh. watched the film Airplane. Just kidding. Uh <laughs> um, no. Uh, so while I was interested, I'll get into my thoughts as we continue to talk about it, because it sounds like you've got a lot to get into, but... um. Yeah, I went into it blind intentionally. Uh, you know, I, I knew that it was sort of the, 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 the film that kicked off the disaster movie craze really was what we reviewed this time last year, Poseidon Adventure. Um, you know, this one, it sounds like it had a lot of awards. Did it do good at the box office? It was, it was a huge success. It was actually one of the first films in history uh, to reach over $100 million at the box office. Gotcha. I don't remember what the the data is on 
Poseidon, but I would guess that it probably beat this one. Though, yeah, right? it, yeah, it did. Uh, the airport so, and its success allowed movies like uh, Poseidon Adventure and The Towering Inferno to be taken seriously as uh, contenders to be yes. made. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, so that's like I feel like for a good chunk of this movie, I was wondering when the disaster was going to happen. Like, because it's very, this is what you would call a slow burn. Movie. Yes. Um, because there are a lot of wheels turning, but mm -hmm. you don't really see where it's going until like, so the disaster is essentially a guy brings a bomb onto an airplane. Right. But like, yes. you do not, I was looking at the time when they finally revealed that. Cause it was like, almost 40 minutes into yeah. the movie and i was for the whole thing i was like is this like about like a disaster at all or is this just like about a bunch of like little things happening at the airport um by the end it it was very satisfying to see like everything to come together but i gotta say uh this this one was kind of boring for me for, oh like, no a <laughs> um i there were there were certain storylines i cared about more than other storylines so i wasn't completely like dead or anything mm -hmm. but it was it was a little bit the the last like 30 minutes is great i will say that much um it definitely brings a spectacle but i do think like as far as like a really exciting movie i think poseidon kind of stands the test of time a little bit better than this one mm -hmm. i feel like if you put a zoomer in front of this movie they would tune out in like 15 minutes yeah uh and that's like the thing like i i i my my opinion of the movie changed a little bit by the time i finished it but i was kind of thinking like this is an example of just because it was the first one to do something it mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily the best one to do something mm -hmm. uh one thing i do uh i said this in our review of poseidon adventure and i feel like it's a good kind of comparison to this one that one came out right before film kind of shifted and a lot of like new school directors came into the mix. Yeah. And I was talking about how Poseidon kind of felt like it was straddling the line between old Hollywood and the new school filmmakers. Cause mm -hmm. it had really good cinematography and really like exciting spectacle, but the, the script was very classic Hollywood, the dialogue and everything. This one feels like an old movie. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I just don't think it has kind of that timeless. Opinion. I do think uh, you could sit like a young person down to the Poseidon adventure and, and they would get excited. And I think part of that is because the action kicks in a lot sooner. Yeah. Um, and then there was like just some kind of like odd things that like are typical of movies of this time. Like the score for parts of it didn't really match like i understand the beginning credits it's an overture it's kind of like playing the whole music for the movie but a lot of it is like this very bombastic exciting sort of stuff and you're just watching like airport day-to-day -day stuff and it just comes off as kind of like mismatched um so actually the score is actually one of my favorite things about this movie oh i'm not saying it's bad no no I'm i just know saying, like you know, it's funny, like, I, I made fun of the whole airplane thing. Yeah. Uh, some people, I've so we talked about this in messages without revealing too much about, like, the movie, because we don't talk about it and whatever, but, like, this is sort of understood to be the movie that Airplane was parodying it. Uh, I don't think, so apparently it isn't. Uh, Zero hour, hour is the one that you found, like, yes. that, that it was. And I kind of, that made sense, because I don't think that this really had a lot of similarities to Airplane. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, but the one thing like talking about the score, one of the kind of jokes in airplane is the very opening credits. It's like playing really exciting music is nothing is happening in mm -hmm. an airplane. Uh, and then like the airplane like crashes into the, the airport. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't, again, I don't think airplane was necessarily parroting this movie. I do think it was probably parroting like most disaster movies, but I do think that was something, the score is not bad. But again, if you like, I'm, you probably will rewatch this next time you watch this. Just see if you get what I mean about like the overture at the beginning. It seems really mitch, mismatched with just seeing like, you know, the day to day operations of an airport and hearing dun 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 dun. dun, dun you know, like it just it felt weird. Like it, it felt weird to you. Well, it at least sets the tone that this is a disaster movie because again, if you just were watching this and you didn't know that it was you wouldn't it wouldn't occur to you that it was going to be one because for like 
an hour and 40 minutes, nothing really disastrous or exciting happens. I like not, not exciting. Like there, this, this feels more of like, it's like a lot of melodrama for most of the movie. Mm -hmm. Like it's a lot of characters and sort of like, you know, relationships and there's people cheating and there's someone stowing away on airplanes. And, you know, it's like a lot of little stories and then it all comes together at the end when the whole issue of the guy with the bomb Yes. happens on the flight. So that's um, actually kind of a good segue. So I want to cut this actually has a very this has a very big and you'll see what I mean when I explain a very big connection to airplane that I actually found out after the fact. So you are correct. Airport airplane doesn't necessarily parody this movie, but airport launched a whole franchise of movies um, that are sequels to this airport 75 airport 77 and airport 79. And so air air airplane uh, borrows the plot from zero hour uh but it's kind it, it's kind of understood that it's kind of it parodies a lot of sort of just the the uh the things that are that are used the plot devices like you said the scores things like that i sent you um a scene to watch uh yes okay that, so that is why i was curious why you sent me that uh even after watching it i know what scene in airplane it's making fun of Yes. But I was wondering if you knew that or if you were sending it to me because you liked the scene or something. But I, like I said too, also like are the sequels or is this is the date in the title or is are all the sequels just called airport? The date but is then, in the like, title. It's instead of okay. calling it like instead of calling it airport two, it's airport nineteen seventy five. Which I actually okay. thought was kind of just different and kind of cool. But um so I it I makes I, it very confusing if you're looking at right, it. Right, because I, I I know you messaged me and you were just like so which version are we watching? <laughs> well, so the thing is when there is when there is a remake on IMDb or you know looking up movies, uh, if the if there's a remake, they put the date in parentheses. Right. So at the time it probably seemed like a good idea, but like in the you know, they couldn't have known that in the future there'd be so many remakes of so many movies. So when you're looking it up, it doesn't help because all it does is confuse you because you're like, oh, wow, there's like five remakes of this movie. Because yeah, until you told me, I didn't know they were sequels. I thought it was like, oh, wow, they remade the movie like five <laughs> years later. That's pretty weird. They remade you it know? every um, three years for like 10 yeah, years. <laughs> I, I, so again, at the time, I'm sure it was probably a more clever way of titling it. But mm -hmm. nowadays, man, it makes it a headache to like look for the one you're looking for. <laughs> So, um, so one of the things I wanted to get into specifically, and I want to tell you what the exact tie-in for. So, you like we like you said, the plot from Airplane is a direct uh, is a direct reference to the plot of the movie Zero Hour. Now, what's interesting about that is I looked this up. So, Airport is based on the book Airport by Arthur Haley. Arthur Haley wrote a screenplay. Uh, where did I put it? He wrote, oh yeah, he wrote a screenplay called Flight Into Danger, which was a TV special for Canadian TV. He later, like, adapted that into, and that came out in 1956 or 55. He later novelized that into a book called Runway 08. And that was then adapted into Zero Hour. So the guy who wrote Airport also wrote Zero Hour. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, <laughs> well, and also, again, like, I'm guessing the reason you sent me that clip, uh, yeah, cause... which the clip in question is from one of the sequels, and it's like a nun singing to a little girl. <laughs> yeah. If any of you listening are fans of Airplane, you probably know the scene that it's making fun of as well, because, yeah. like, there's a bit where it's like, oh... <laughs> You know, oh, I, I dabble a little bit on guitar and she takes it and suddenly she's like excellent. And the, the funny thing about that clip was it kind of maybe unintentionally was already kind of funny because here's this nun being like, oh, I love rock and roll and I love. You know, and, it's soon, and, and the song is really nice and everything, but it is kind of funny that this woman who's just like trying to cheer up this girl suddenly a. a amazing singer and guitarist <laughs> well you saw like, who becomes the like a musical for two minutes <laughs> you you saw you saw who the little girl was didn't you in airport was was it the little girl was it uh what's her face from the exorcist yeah that was linda blair from the exorcist that's she what was... i thought yeah it sounded like her voice uh it looked like she was it was because what it looked like she might have been younger was this at, was that after uh, the exorcist i'd have to look i'd have to look i, I think, forget when the exorcist was 
The Exorcist was like 78, I think. I might be wrong about that, but... Well, so I sent you that scene specifically because that's the one scene um, that specifically is shot for shot, essentially... Uh, a direct oh, the dialogue reference. is exactly yeah. the same as Airplane. Well, it, it, uh, the, or the the only difference is she sings a funnier song. Like I think she plays like some like you know famous rock song or right. something. Oh, 1973 was The Exorcist, so this was two years later. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, she looked. She looked. Now that I know that it's her, it's like she looked kind of younger in the movie. She also like I think the difference is she had blonde hair. Yeah. So probably that's that's the big reason I didn't recognize her. So that well, yeah, I, rec- I recognized her voice. Yeah, it sounded like her, her. Her voice is pretty iconic. But yeah, that that's kind of a notorious scene in the airport franchise because essentially it's only there because Helen Reddy was playing the character, and I, I don't know, she wanted to promote an album or something. <laughs> that's literally the only reason it's in there. And it, it, it makes sense. I haven't seen the movie, but I would bet that it probably was just as out of place if you saw the movie. Oh, I saw the movie. It was out of place. I'm like, why are we singing this? And, but it's like, it's like not even just like a, it's like an entire song. Just three minutes yeah. out of the movie is just this nun singing. So that that's just out of place the movie. So, and, and I know you were, and I'm actually going to get to this part. This leads into this too. You were talking about how the disaster doesn't happen until like almost two hours into the movie. Uh, we don't even find out about it until 40 minutes in the movie. And, you know, and so like as a disaster, it doesn't really work. And so my argument has always been that airport was never essentially supposed to be a, like a disaster movie. The best way I always describe it is this is essentially 12 hours at an airport and it's very much in it's very much just about the people that are there and what happens at at, at this one particular airport this one time uh, and so to me i have never classified it even though it technically is in that genre i guess i've never classified it as strictly a disaster movie i've always just distra- as a drama with disaster movie elements but like well you and i completely agree then cuz this is one i really would say it's almost it might have sparked interest in like the, I'm guessing the last 30 minutes really excited people because if that's what led to the Poseidon adventure, it's like well you, you know, know there you go that's the spectacle that people are looking for at the theater and everything. But if I were to categorize this, I don't think I haven't watched all the other disaster movies, but I really don't think it fits in with them. Besides the whole people pulling together or whatever, but well, like well that then you also have the all star cast. Uh, yes oh yeah th- th- this kind of started that but and i will say if you ever George kennedy is my boy joe he was, uh, he was my favorite uh, uh, he's my parents favorite too my dad was going in and out because i rewatched it last night just to prepare and my dad was going out he's like is patroni here yet is patroni here yet i'm like Not, you just missed him dad sorry uh no, just George... off the bat i was like this poor man is is macking on his wife and <laughs> right he's, and he had, he's got to go in i it's also like if anyone uh george kennedy um if if that name sounds familiar, he I think this was afterwards, but he's uh, famously in uh, uh, Cool Hand Luke. Yeah, he he was nominated for best supporting for that, um, and he's in a lot of stuff. Uh, he's really great. He actually. Uh, but he, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just gonna. He's very good at playing like blue collar characters, and he does that really well here. Yeah, he's 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 a very much a very man's man. And if you if you ever decide you'd I think you'd enjoy the sequels more because the sequels are more by the numbers, a disaster movie. The thing happens the first 10 minutes in and it's all about them trying to deal with it. Uh, But for example, the second I'm like, I'm not exactly like a disaster movie fan, but I will say that's the element I feel like. Like, again, if I'm, like, reviewing this and, you know, recommending it to people or whatever, like, I think the thing that uh, is more enticing to people is the kind of crazy, again, like, Poseidon Adventure in the first, like, 20 minutes, you have a set being turned upside down yeah. and people, like, falling. That's, you know, as grim as it is, that's what a lot of people going to those types of movies oh, are looking I'll, for. I'll be first to admit, that's one, that's, even uh, Ronald Neem, the, the producer of the Poseidon Adventure, uh, or director. I think no, he was the director. He he said no. I think the movie is as successful as it was because of those one and a half minutes of the ship turning over. <laughs> it's shocking, man. I said this last year when we reviewed it, but it like I hadn't seen it in such a long time that I forgot how 
very very disturbing it gets as far as like the carnage that you see yeah. for like a movie in the 70s it was really ahead of its time as far as like really it was only two years after this movie yep and it's it's just night and day like this one the it, i was actually surprised it got as dark as it did with what happens in this one mm-hmm. uh and the special effects like when everything is getting sucked out of the plane like it it was pretty good uh, but it definitely was not as uh, harrowing as the beginning of the Poseidon adventure. In yeah. fact, only, you know, one person dies and one person gets seriously injured, but otherwise everyone's fine. So well, yeah. that right there is kind of a big difference. And and, well, and like I said, this, this is really like, a, like and like we I think we've both agreed on this, but this is really a movie that's just about 12 hours at an airport. This is what happens here. This is what the people are doing. It's it's the best way to describe it is it's the reason why my mom watches SVU, Law and Order SVU. She doesn't watch it for the crimes. She watches it for the characters. And so for, to, sure. for me, Airport is a movie that if you're not into the characters, you won't you won't like it. Uh, and uh, and and actually, like I Joe Joe's one of my favorites, but also Burt Lancaster is a really good linchpin for the movie because yeah. he's so. It's just nice, like, he's the only one in the whole airport who gives a shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> he, like, and, and everyone, his wife is the worst, man. She's, oh. oh, no one pays attention to me. It's like, dude, he's, he is saving lives, essentially. Like, even if there's not, like, a disaster, like, he is out there shoveling snow so that planes can get inside this poor man well, you know what the worst scene with her is to me is when he calls home to talk to his children and they talk to him for like five seconds and then she comes like get off the phone children i have to talk to your father i'm like oh my she's, god she's like exactly ugh. i mean again like what he he kind of lays it out like with their um their little fight you know like oh you could be making so much more money and doing all this and he's like i like what i do and it's it's useful she doesn't care yeah. she just wants you know like the her husband to have a cushy job where he's home all the time and it's it's so like again he's the other character i really thought was like a good like central character for the movie because he's so selfless like he is doing the worst jobs just to like get things moving at the airport Mm -hmm. and no one (laughs) the only person who appreciates it are like the various employees he works for even his bosses like the the committee yeah that like tries to like vote him out of like closing the airport down or whatever it's it no one no one appreciates him and i that was that was one of the storylines that i i liked because i was like this poor guy he's like the only one who cares well <laughs> besides and, his like assistant and all the you know, oh and, and then also he's cared but and then dean martin's character he was the other male lead in the movie he i didn't the, he I was did such not, a, he uh, was such a dink in this whole movie <laughs> yeah no i like so the one time i like him is like when stuff's going down on the airplane but yeah. he's a he, he's one of the storylines where i was falling asleep because i was kind of like he's a terrible person uh it, 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 if you haven't well you sh- as a review like we spoil the movies but he's cheating on his wife yeah um which already makes me not like him he um, right off the bat like is argumentative with burt lancaster's character yeah. And yeah, like the way he handles the situation on the plane is the only time in the whole movie I like him. Everything else I like could care less about him or his, you know, his baby out of wedlock and all that other stuff. Well, you know, uh, I think he does a fine job playing the character. I like. I, you yeah, know, no, he's, he, he's great in the role, but it's just his character is just so unlikable. One of the big the other... things that bugs me about his character is he makes this big. He like threatens the the ramp attendant. For it's like you're gonna make a stop and refuel and we're gonna have to refund people yeah. and then later he's like oh these idiot penguins let them on the plane dude they were trying oh, to yeah. get they were trying to get her off the plane and you said no we're gonna go ahead um so no, i do he's out of everyone he's the most unlikable character <laughs> and that includes the man with a bomb on an airplane <laughs> <laughs> like that <laughs> sorry dean martin but you played the biggest jerk in the whole movie the other character and i have a feeling you're gonna disagree with me on this the other one who kind of got on my nerves was the uh the stowaway the old lady oh she was the comic for the whole movie i was like why do i hate her so much because it's not like i care about the airline or anything like why do i care that she's she's so selfish She's it's so because fun. of how smug she is. It yes. wasn't that she was doing it. It was the attitude she had. That right. Because for the whole movie, I was really like, why do I hate this old lady so much? 
and by the end of the movie and she's another one where during the the crisis situation she does the right thing yeah but man i just and i'm even kind of happy for her getting the lifetime supply of free flights because at yeah. least now it's like she has no re- and that too that too at the end she's like well now it's not fun anymore I know. Like, lady, <laughs> lady got free shut flights. Up. you've got your free flights go go travel the world and stop bothering people <laughs> oh my God. well and it's uh what does she do that the, the line that bugs me the most and like you said, it's because she's just so smug about it. Is she she she, she tells uh, the guy that's that 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 uh, uh, I forget what his name is, but the the gentleman who who is supposed to be watching her at the airport she she tells him oh you know what i confided to my fellow passenger that i was doing this and he had the nerve to turn me in because he was a policeman they should wear uniforms all the time a person doesn't know you know you could just i don't know not commit a crime and then not brag about it (laughs) yeah exactly like you didn't have to tell him anything you could have just been you know just stuck with your sob story about your daughter in new york that you're constantly telling people i'm surprised i'm glad we agree on that i was expecting you to be like oh no the old lady i mean she, i'm glad you find her annoying too i mean i, I, I find she, her smug too she she is pretty funny in some parts though no she and that's the that's the thing i understood that she was comic relief and that's why i was like talking to myself through the movie like why do i hate this character so much <laughs> Um, because I understood that it was supposed to be for laughs, Mm -hmm. but yeah, like uh, thinking of every, every storyline in the movie, I think those were the two that I cared the least, Mm -hmm. at least with the old lady, she was interacting with like characters I was more tuned into. Like there's the whole meeting with her and Burt Lancaster and, uh, the, the other woman who was she the one who won for best supporting actress? Yes. Uh, the good for her. She was really, she was like, no, 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 no. Uh, the one oh, that, not, her. The, not the one that won. Oh my God. The, the person that won for lead actor for I'm supporting actress was actually, uh, Ada Kwanzaa, the, the stowaway you didn't like. <laughs> she won. She won the, that's Oscar. what I actually, pre- like I, when, when you were listing people off, that's who I thought it was. Uh, which again, good for her. She did, she did deserve the award. Yeah. She played the character perfectly fine. I just hated the character. Yeah. That's not which. Her but fault. I mean, I mean, <laughs> she played it. If you, you're supposed to dislike her, but find her funny. So you know, she did it well. True, but I didn't find her funny. Is the problem? <laughs> <laughs> I understood she was supposed to be funny. I, just I mean, didn't think she was funny. <laughs> but her whole her whole system for stowing away is that, that's like a totally pre pre-terrorism yes. world that's Dude, like that's like a time the capsule whole time i'm watching the movie i'm like you know no one like i i feel like young people would not like this movie but i do think the whole idea of there even being a way to stow away on airplanes is such an alien concept these yeah. days because the amount of security you have to go through is so absurd like this movie was so like i i remember flying when i was a very very young kid and i do remember how it used to be but even so, like by the time I was born, like there already were so many more security protocols yeah. than when this movie came out. So it is, it's almost fascinating to watch how it used to be because it is so lax. The amount, it's almost, it's almost comical, like looking back because, like, and even as, especially like with the 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 situation on this plane being a guy bringing a bomb. You couldn't get away with that nowadays. Like, <laughs> you, well, not you, in this you, obvious be, of a like, manner. T- TSA is not great at their job, but they could find a fucking thing of TNT in a suitcase. Like it's it's the whole thing. It's very it's all it's a very fun like relic of its time to like watch and see what it used to be like to fly because so many things that happen in the movie could not happen today. It's ridiculous. Well, well and you know, that kind of, I kind of wanted to bring that up. And so that, that's kind of a good thing. So one of the things that I really, really like about this movie is it's such a time capsule of just a whole nother way of making a movie and telling a story. And I want to start with starting with just, uh, let's I just want to start with something small like the costume design Edith head you know she's a huge she's huge huge in, in uh, costume design for movies she did all the costumes for this and I don't know how she did it but the w- however she worked she was able to make airline uniforms seem almost lush in the way in the detailing that she put into them and then I want to go to the one of my favorite things also about this movie is the is the split screen with the phone calls and then with the oh yeah no actually no I I was going to bring that up too. The editing in this is really good. Uh, Like, and not just, it has, it's funny. It comes out, it came out in the seven in 1970, but it's got a very like 1960s sort of, it uses split screen a lot. And the editing was one of the standouts for me, actually. Like I, I really liked how, 
they did and i've talked about this in like other kind of older movies that you like that i don't particularly like where i talk about how to make something more exciting mm-hmm. and this is a great example of doing that actually because in a lot of these scenes it could just be a basic shot reverse shot sort of thing but the split screen was very stylized yeah. and it added a lot to scenes that could have been more boring right um the, the big ones that i'm thinking of are when uh towards uh, towards the end of the movie, when they are when they're bringing the plane back in, and they are talking with air traffic, they're talking with the plane, they're talking with local air traffic control, and then they're talking with traffic control in Toronto. And so you know they have the split screen, and then in the middle of oh no, it's not, it's the two pilots talking, and then in the middle of it, they put like a circle with the air traffic controller. And I just, something about that is just so interesting to me. And I was reading people talking about this and somebody said, somebody said this as a negative. I actually think this is on purpose and it works. They said, you know, they use so much of this, of the stylized split screen that you can't really focus on any of the people talking. And I'm like, I kind of think that's on purpose because especially in a situation where we're talking with the Toronto air traffic control and the Chicago air traffic control and, and the pilots, it's, it's, it's so imagine what they're going through right now they're probably having a hard time focusing on what's going on so it's well, it's and also actually have you seen the film united 93 uh i think i saw that in high school um well so i first off i think you'd like it a lot because it's kind of it had it does a lot of things that you tend to like in these kinds of movies but that's actually how like if, if anyone hasn't seen it who's listening it's about one of the hijacked planes on 9 11 and it's very uh, formulaic, not formulaic. It's um, it's very like, like st- almost documentary like, mm-hmm. uh, and that's how they explain like the plane getting hijacked and stuff. Like you see the people talking about it and like all the air traffic controllers and stuff. So I don't know if maybe this movie was uh, some inspiration for the, mm-hmm. the director or something, but it, it's interesting. You bring that up because it actually, it's like that in that film as well. Well, it's, I just like, you and, 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 and like you've, this is just, it's just such a perfect time capsule of this. We have it even, and, and I don't know. And I think my, I tried to explain to my mom. I think she got it with the, which so going back to the score, the score, you know, you know, it has its like it's big bombastic, but it also has it. There's just something about it that just sounds very '60s about it, and it's kind. Of, it, it, like I said, it's it's in addition to, to you know adding the excitement or or danger or whatever of the situation that they're going through or the pressure. There's also some parts of it that just sound very, very. It's it's, it's almost like it's admiring the luxury of air of air travel at the time because you know back then they still had actual cl- cups and glasses and and blankets oh, and stuff that's that's actually something that made me even more angry at the old lady because <laughs> i was thinking of how they like cook filet mignon for people and stuff back then and i'm just like this this woman like it's one thing today if you did it like oh here's your free peanuts or something yeah. but like back then it was like basically you get like first class treatment and coach too like it's Ugh. but and, and also like going back you said so edith head did the costumes isn't she the the legendary designer she's she, isn't she the one that edna mode from the incredibles was based on yes she she she's oh she's my a, god wait i didn't wow she did the costumes for this she she's like a she's like a god as she, far as, as like far costume as costume design goes yeah and that's what i'm trying to that, that's what i was basically i'm like she made normal airline uniforms look almost luxurious it's funny, like, I, I'm actually a, a fan of her work in other movies. I'd have to look at her, like, page to, like, know which movies I, I like the most. But it's interesting. It's very, like, because I didn't, I didn't think the costumes were bad. I just, they're very uh, understated, I guess. Like, it, it, it blends in well. I didn't know, like, I didn't, it's one of those things where I don't even think of the costume design. The only time I really thought about it was actually the old lady. I thought the way she was dressed was kind of <laughs> funny because she looked like, like a widow or something. Yeah. Uh, the the pilot uniforms are pretty good. Um, yeah, what? I mean, again, it's not like bad work or anything. It's just interesting that this legend of, of costume design did this movie because well, what's it's interesting. So... What's interesting about yeah. that is is uh, she actually uh, for a short time she had I think a limited collection based on the looks in this movie called the airport look. That she collaborated with some um, fabric for, with a, with some fashion house about I forget, I didn't look up what it was called but they had a brief uh, airport look line 
uh, based on the looks in this movie. And, and what I mean when I talk about how they look luxurious, I mean, the, like, for example, the, the pilot, specifically the pilot's uniforms were very tailored. And if you looked at the edges of like their trench coats, they had this piping around it. And like, I know that's not a big deal, but it, it just adds a certain level of luxury to it. And, you know, at this time, air travel was still considered pretty much a luxury. I mean, like this, we have this one guy, uh, the guy that I hated in the movie, uh, the obnoxious passenger who ruins everything. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> he, he says that he, he says when, 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 when he complains about the stale peanuts, he says that he paid like $434 for a ticket. Uh, somebody for the seventies. That's mind blowing. That's yeah. Like, that's, that's, that's funny, like three grand today. First class. He's not even he's in not first, even first class. In... Yeah. And he spent three oh. grand on a ticket. That's, like by it by today's standards it's like it's just there's just there's just so much that went into like i said just certain parts of the score with the costume design the production design in this is they really were able to kind of t- capture a time capsule of this luxurious time of air travel and i thought that was I, I i that's one of the things i really really like about this movie is it really does kind of capture just a little moment of our world perfectly and i thought I, that's one of the things i really really like about it um so we talked about that we talked about kind of the look of the movie now see this this is interesting because i think you'll you'll kind of not be surprised by this but despite it being a huge success it was the book was a huge success critics hated this movie they hated it they said it was really they said like what you said that it's slow it's predictable uh roger ebert i did at not the... say i did not think i actually would argue it's not predictable See, at all i was i was kind of the same I'm way like, by by the time things were happening i could tell what was going to happen but again for most of the movie i was like is there even going to be a disaster or is this just like about people at an airport so per- slow, I agree with, but predictable, nah, not really. A lot of um, I actually even up until the bomb went off, I didn't think the bomb was gonna go off. Like this movie is so very like not again. It, like when it happens, it's actually kind of shocking because it's such a left turn into like dark territory. Yeah, that it's so hell no, I don't think it's. But that is interesting, especially because the academy tends to kind of go by what movie critics say. Yeah. So that's that is interesting that the Academy liked this so much, but maybe it had something to do with the box office draw. Maybe like, but that that is odd to me because I don't like I didn't particularly like this movie, but I don't think it was a bad movie. I just think part of it was like it's not really to my taste. Yeah. But the screenplay again, like I appreciate when things all come together. Yeah. So even like it it made me happy when <laughs> when the bomb went off. <laughs> <laughs> not literally but like when 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 everyone is on the plane from all the different perspectives and stuff and things are happening like it made me feel like okay this movie didn't waste my time like and and the payoff was worth it yeah like when when the everything happens it's like okay this this was worth sitting for like a full movie's length of time waiting to happen <laughs> um but yeah, so critics, the book did well. Critics didn't like it. Critics didn't like the book when the book came out. They thought it was just mm-hmm. melodramatic. Well, my mom read the book when it came out. Well, back when she saw the movie, when she was a teen, she says the book's kind of, the book's kind of trashy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, that, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> like, you know, they go more, they go more into the, the, the sex part of it, the love part of it. But what's interesting to me, though, is this is, despite how you feel about how so this is, this movie was super progressive. I mean, we have talking about, you know, in the late 60s, 60s early 70s a a main character that we're supposed to sympathize with and like uh talking openly about possibly getting an abortion and and like i know you said that storyline didn't you but that was kind of a huge deal and actually uh one of one of uh uh I, i did not write his name down but a reviewer on um uh, Roger Ebert's website, because there's still a website around for him, uh, commented about this movie saying that because of that one particular conversation, that movie got the equivalent of an R rating in Mexico. And so he wasn't able to see this movie until like high school or something. Be- That's pretty wild. I'm not exactly surprised. I, it's funny. I almost forgot about that scene until you brought it up. But like, so I, I agree with you. I do think it was progressive, but for the time, because what I thought when I was watching that, and I think part of it was because I just didn't like the character, mm-hmm. but I didn't like how it was like he was deciding. 
it's it wasn't her choice too. you mm-hmm. know what i mean it's like hey uh my, this woman i'm i'm having sex with outside of my marriage she's gonna get pregnant should i force her to get an abortion you know what i mean like, right it's, yeah it's like, like it, it's it was not kind his of decision, framed but... as, like, as if it was his decision to have the baby and that kind of again i think part of it is because i already didn't like the character <laughs> um but i did but i i, I was uh, surprised that they talked about it in the movie like that that was even an option i didn't think that that was even going to be like something talked about so I, I agree with it being progressive. I don't cancel this movie or anything, but I will <laughs> right. say like it's progressive for the time because yeah. there still is kind of that sexist angle of like her not even being in the room to talk about it. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I'm well, she's pregnant. So what should I do about it? You know, like, well, and, you know, that's kind of one of the things I want to bring up is the gender politics of this movie with it being, you know, the, it's it's it, it's actually, you know, this movie came out during a time period where there was sort of a revolution of the sexes, the battle of the sexes. Uh, women are were you know going more into the workforce they were they this is around the time i think the pill was introduced uh she, i think she even mentioned she went off the pill i'm which again talking about the pill that's a big deal to talk about just openly like and, and it's in a character and you know what i mean is it's in a character that we're supposed to sympathize with and like and so her talking about just not taking the pill one time and you know things happen and then possibly getting an abortion or adoption you know the fact that they, that they gave that they gave that female character, I know you said that you know it's still kind of played as though it's Dean Martin's decision what happens, but the fact they still give the character, uh, they write the character with enough to have a mind to think about these things on her own, I thought was was pretty well done. And like you, I know you said that she still goes back and kind of asks him what she should do. Um, well, she's not even in the conversation is what I'm saying. It was her decision to go off the pill, and I hadn't considered that, so you are very on the money with that. My problem, and it's not even a problem, I just think it's kind of a you know, very dated way of looking at it, is that she's not there talking with the other... Po- you know what I mean? Like, he, she's not there. She's not actually giving her opinion on... You know, like... She even says to him earlier, like, I'm going to have it. You you know, I, I know you're married. I know you you don't have to take care of me or anything like that. That's her being, that's a very feminist kind of angle or whatever. But then later in the movie, he's talking with the other pilot, like, oh, well, she's pregnant. What should, you know, I'm thinking maybe she should get an abortion. It's like, well, she's having the kid with her without you, buddy. Like, well, it's it, not your choice. So like that, that to me, and again, I don't think this ruins the movie yeah. or anything. I just, I think, again, it's just kind of showing that the times were changing, but they hadn't changed yet. Yeah. Well, um, and actually, because again, like she's not part of the conversation. She's not back. She's not with him. Like, oh, should I keep the baby? I don't know. Let's ask my friend here. No, it's like, hey, buddy, my girlfriend on the side is having a baby. Should I force her to get an abortion? Like, but again, like that has nothing to do with whether or not it's progressive. I'm just saying, like, it's yeah, because I because you're right. It is. I again, I was surprised when they brought abortion up and the the pill. She does mention that. I hadn't thought about that. Well, uh, you know, what's interesting also is the is the the way the film was was totally willing to kind of uh kind of play with the whole the whole affair thing because even at the beginning of the movie when we meet him getting out of the cab with his wife and he he asks her what she wants and she says oh i want some gloves he's like oh you're size eight right she she responds right away no i'm the one with size six and a half gloves like she totally knows that he plays around on her but she, he, but she's she's of the belief at this point still in the movie that he will always come back home, and we get that very sad scene at the end where maybe he won't come home this time. Yeah, well, and then also like with the stowaway character, like that's even kind of a play on uh, you know expecting this little old woman to be harmless. You know, no, she is a, a dangerous con artist. <laughs> well, maybe not like physically dangerous, but you know, like so that even is kind of like a little progressive. Like this little old lady is totally playing with these people like I, I i'm convinced she has no daughter or late husband she's just right saying that so that she can get away <laughs> like she probably like you know but the fact that people like give her the opportunity to screw her themselves over because they just think that she's harmless like that even is kind of a little bit of a feminist angle that i'm sure well even when probably even probably wasn't common well even when they first bring her in and and she, and the guy's like we have a stowaway. She's like, well, bring, I think she even says bring him in. And 
the chick comes, you can even see everyone's just expression just changes when they see her. But like you said, she, you don't expect her, but she is cold and calculating. She even sits there and says, she's like, you know, we could prosecute you for this. She's like, yeah, but you won't, because how will it look for you to prosecute an old lady? Yep. Like, that- and I actually kind of liked the, the two different reactions. Uh, the, the Burt Lancaster's like girlfriend kind of <laughs> is like shocked that she said that. And he's just sort of smirking. <laughs> like he's like, oh, this, this, <laughs> this bird, she knows how to play the system. But like his, <laughs> the, other, the woman's like so annoyed. <laughs> like, She's like, oh great, her just side, give her sandwiches. Just-, just give her sandwiches, coffee, anything. Uh but so um, another thing I want to go to so after that so we so we ha- we sh- we've talked about the gender politics of this movie, um, which well I have one more thing actually thing to say about this so if you ever choose to go on uh, and watch any more of this um, I will say the quality in them is a lot lower <laughs> in the sequels they're more by the numbers disastery but I will say as far as gender politics I think this one is the most progressive because and I actually. I actually like, I love Petroni in this one. I don't like him in the later movies. He is pretty sexist in the later movies. <laughs> he says stuff like, he tells like the the female workers that it's called a cockpit for a reason. <laughs> Wait, is Petroni, Petroni is George uh, Kennedy. The, oh, jo- oh, oh. So he's fine in this one, but I almost, he, he's also the only character that recurs in all the other airport movies. Um, but hey, I mean, <laughs> wait, you mean I get to barely do any work and I get to be in a bunch of sequels? Sure. Well, I mean, <laughs> like, here's just so you know, this plot of the sequels, I mean, and this is one of the reasons why I say airplane sort of takes off because the sequels get so ridiculous with their plots. The second one is most people say the second one is the better of the sequels. I disagree. I actually think the thir- the 77, the third one is uh, the second one is a small plane flies through the cockpit of the passenger jet and a stewardess has to land the plane uh the, that is insane that is like something out of a fast and furious right movie. what <laughs> That's the, like... the third one which is my favorite of the sequels still it's still you know air, the original airport i think i still have a lot higher than this one but the set is uh some guy is some rich guy played by jimmy stewart is he's uh bringing a bunch of his like celebrity and rich friends to an auction on his island or something by private jet and there is a smuggling attempt to rob the plane of all the cargo it's carrying and it ends up crashing into the water and they survive underwater and they have to kind of like scuba dive out uh to me that one's the best of the sequels and then uh, then we have airport 79 the concord which it's 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 so baffling because it's it's so ridiculous we have two terrorist attempts on the same flight path like the first time it's being chased by fighter jets and the second time they program the cargo door to open up and during it's it's odd but if you watch the re- if you ever just want to have like a laugh <laughs> just watch the rest of them and you'll kind of see more of sort of what the it, what 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 air what airplane is really poking fun at that's why i say it's off the franchise not necessarily this first one because it's it's just it's ridiculous uh of all the stuff they go through um i want to go into kind of some more just get facts i've learned about this about the movie um go so for it in the background so have you heard of the producer jack webb what has he done he sounds familiar so he was famous for again in the 70s he produced a lot of the dramas that were on tv at the time notably adam 12 uh dragnet and my favorite emergency uh, okay. So uh, it just so happened a lot of uh, the recurring characters, not as themselves, but the actors who play them, show up in this particular airport movie uh, as uh, background characters. Uh, for example, the one that I most of you won't, you wouldn't have caught this, but the one I most of is Marco Lopez. He plays one of the firemen on Emergency. He shows up as one of the passengers in this movie, and you see him a few times. You see from, and because we just talked about this with the monsters, uh, the the I don't know, now I'm blanking on her name. It's like Pat something, but she who plays Marilyn in the original series or one of the Marilyns, uh, she is a passenger on this plane too. Uh, so we, we have kind of a lot of just background people who went on to do big things or came from bigger things um, that were just kind of in the background of this. Um, the 
you know, do you remember with the turbulence effect uh, when they had turbulence on the plane? So yeah. this is kind of funny. This just this this is classic. You know, before they had special effects, that was done by essentially PAs had like two by fours that were attached to the side of the set, and they would just rock it back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's how they achieve turbulence in this um the, t- the way you the way you built it up i was expecting you to say they just shook the camera <laughs> <laughs> i mean i've actually seen movies where they've done that uh but there's just something i, do, I think power rangers that's how they did it whenever there was like an earthquake or something they just got on the ground as if they'd fallen over and they were just shaking the camera <laughs> i wonder if they did that in earthquake at all <laughs> Um, the airline in the movie, TGA Airlines, um, for like years after this movie came out, because they they had already that logo and those luggage tags and everything already, TGA Airlines would just show up in Universal Films as like background things just like forever after that. Um, so we talked about, oh, this is also the first 70 millimeter film to play at the Radio City Music Hall. Um, and the reason why it showed there was because the movie went over budget and Universal was convinced that they were not going to get any sort of profit off this movie at all. So their solution was, we're going to show it as a limited engagement at like key markets like New York, LA, Chicago, before word of mouth spreads that it's bad and nobody <laughs> goes to see it. And then it, you know, became this runaway, just like hit, um, uh, the po- that is shocking that the studio didn't even have like faith in it. Again, I like this wasn't particularly something I enjoyed, but I'm still kind of surprised that a, that critics didn't like it and Universal Pictures thought it was going to bomb. Like that is surprising to me. Yeah, I I just it, it's again it's this is like before the blacklist happened, like and and things like that where people kind of knew what like what was necessarily you had to essentially be backed by a studio to make a movie and it's baffling to me why they would have so little faith in a project they were producing well and especially if they put so much money into it again like it's critics not liking it is one thing but again like universal thinking it's going to bomb it's like well then why are you making it why are you hiring like all these famous people to be in it it's it's interesting that that was the the perceived like it's it's weird. <laughs> it's weird that they would even make the movie if they thought it was that bad. Well, apparently Burt Lancaster didn't like this movie either. He called it a piece of junk later in life. He he didn't like this movie either. Uh, and that made me so sad because he was my favorite character in there. I was like, be, the, one of the big things about this was it was two of these leading men who normally would not star opposite each other because you know they're afraid of pulling the attention away from each other were the leads in this movie. And, and you know, one of them was like, I don't even like this. Movie. <laughs> well, you know, I like, it's funny. Like this movie, again, I, I said this um, before, but like, I've already been kind of thinking of like what I might be suggesting for next year. And there's a Burt Lancaster movie. I bet you haven't seen. It's pretty interesting. And uh, is it the swimmer? I mean, yeah. Have you seen it? Uh, I read about it. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I've never go. seen it. Uh, that might be that might be on the uh, the ledger, depending on whether or not we actually get requests to, to review <laughs> anything. Um, um, so one and so one of the last things I really want to talk about there is the is the basis for this story because like you know it was adapted from a book, but the book was actually an adaptation of two uh, major events that happened in the '60s, just a couple years before the book was published. Um, so specifically. Uh, it is based on the 1967 Chicago blizzard, because even though the airport used for the exteriors in this movie was the Minneapolis St. Paul airport, uh, it's basically supposed to, the idea is that it's in Chicago. That's why it's like Lincoln international airport or something. Um, so the, uh, the writer drew inspiration for the 1967 Chicago blizzard, which was apparently horrible. Which is kind of what he Burt Lancaster said at the beginning. He's like, I can't buy equipment for a once in a lifetime blizzard. <laughs> They're like, Well, Anchorage can keep up with this. Why can't you? Because Anchorage gets this all the time. Um, and then it's also he drew inspiration from the bombing of Continental Flight uh, Eleven, in which case a gentleman detonated a bomb in the rear lavatory of the plane so that his family could collect the insurance policy. 
which is essentially what Guerrero's that literally is what happens yeah. in the movie. Um, uh, so unfortunately in that one, nobody survived, but like specifically parts in the film that you remember where they were worried about the, the, the tail of the plane breaking off actually happened in continental flight 11. And then finally, one of the things I wanted to bring up is the, they use an actual plane exterior for the exterior shots of of the of the plane when it lands and that was uh that was a plane that was owned by i think it was i think it's called like it was at the time it was called like flying fox or something it was like the precursor to fedex it's uh, actually pretty impressive because they make that thing drift as right it's coming in pulls to the side and everything so that's pretty cool that they got a real plane to do that well in, in true airport fashion, that pl- that exact plane met a tragic end. On March 21st, 1989, it crashed upon arrival in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Which, I'm sorry. Well, hopefully no one was hurt. I actually did not look at that one up. I'm hoping it was being used as like a cargo plane or something. But... The- there, th- th- that's, that's one of the things I was like, that's just too ear. Well, I will say, like, the special effects in this are sparing, but when they're used, they're really good. I mentioned the suction scene, mm-hmm. like, when the bomb goes off. Uh, but there's also, like, some miniature work for when the plane's in the air that's pretty good. Uh, there's the whole bit where they're digging the one plane out. Like, you know, they, it did, not a lot is used in the movie, but when something happens, it is pretty exciting. So yeah. I will give it that. I wanted to devote a brief period of time to the obnoxious guy <laughs> in the film because he, oh, I know who you're talking, he, Mister Mister slapping his face con- constantly because he's annoying everybody. Oh my god! The way people acted in general when they were dealing with the problem actually just irritated me because so many people were like getting it. Like it, on one hand, like yes, I like it was intentional that they were acting like they were being really rough with the lady. Mm-hmm. Um, And that would be distressing. We've even seen like, what was it? 2018 where that guy was forcibly removed from an airplane and the, the video went viral and everything like that. Oh yeah. You know, like excessive force is a thing, but like the way people were just meddling, like when they grabbed the case from the guy and it's like, that's his property. And And that was the obnoxious guy that took it back. Dude. It's just, it's just crazy. Like, it's like, he's the pilot, man. Don't fight the pilot over Like just, nah, it was frustrating partly because like we were the, we the audience were in on something that the passengers weren't yeah. but it's just like irritating the way that everyone was like very meddlesome one one side actor I thought was really funny was that little boy who oh was, yeah like, very, <laughs> very nerdy I also liked Dean Martin's way of dealing with him where yeah. he just used so many big words that the kid didn't understand what he was talking about so it shut him up <laughs> Well, because he was the only one that realized they were like, turning oh, around. What was he talking about? Their son. And he's like, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. <laughs> Shut up. Leave me alone. <laughs> uh, no, but like, and that's a very interesting. It's just if you talk about the way the, the way that people were back then, especially in regards to a quote unquote little old lady, like the guy that was sitting next to her, which I thought was just hilarious. He was like, he was like how dare you treat her this way? And they're just like, oh, I'm sorry. Are you with her? And he's like, oh, no, never mind. <laughs> it's like, it was like, it just, people were just so nosy for the wrong reasons. Like nowadays, like on an airplane, if you even look suspicious, you get tackled by the other passengers and tied up with seatbelts, you know? Well, you know, I, I know a lot of people hate the fact that like people just turn phones on each other when something weird's happening. But mm-hmm. I mean, the thing is like, if something like that were to happen, kind of one of the benefits of that is it gets sorted out later. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like if, if the passenger is being treated with excessive force, it's like you have evidence of it. Yeah. You know, so it's like it, it at least prevents people from like getting into full on fights or whatever. Um, but it's it's like it's compl- it's in this movie it's complicated because it's like if that were how they were treating her, mm-hmm. even though I hate that character, that wouldn't be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that they were going to deal with her was exactly the way that should have been dealt with but the whole point was like that she was in on them trying to get the case away from the guy and no one else knew that and just the fact that everyone was so meddlesome about it especially when the lady was actually doing a great job acting like and then gwen slaps her she was 
yeah, she was she was actually like that was one of the few times, as I said, where I liked her, mm-hmm. where she was actually in on it and she was helpful. <laughs> uh, but then it didn't matter because everyone else was butting into their business. So ugh. and again, the guy that grabs the suitcase back and says that's personal property was the obnoxious guy again who kept complaining about everything. And everybody's so done with him that the, even the priest punches him in the face at the end of the movie. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, and he's the reason the bomb goes off. Right. Like, the it's guy comes fault. out of the bathroom and obnoxious guy is like, he's got a bomb. Get him. And then, you know, it's like they might have diffused the situation. Although I was kind of I was predicting that that's how it was going to end was like he was going to give up. Uh-huh. Uh, so if that had happened, then I would argue the movie was predictable. But the fact that it took a quick left turn and got really dark there at the end was actually pretty exciting. Well, um, and also the it, but, if you noticed after the you know, during the decompression sequence we have a close up of a passenger who's suffocating and his face is like blue first off yeah. i was like that makeup is great second of all that was the obnoxious guy again and i was like he can suffocate for a couple seconds i'm fine with that it's his fault <laughs> but overall this is a movie that i i i could just watch again and again like it it's just it's a movie that invites me into not just a situation, but also just a world that no longer exists in that current form. And I know you had said um, at the beginning that you didn't like the the mash like the, because the overture is uh, like you said it's over scenes of them clearing the snow, clearing. Uh, cl- cl- it's mostly just for the opening credits. I don't again. I don't think the score is bad. I yeah. just think that there's something kind of comically inappropriate about just a very like mundane sort of scene of an airport going about its business. And there's just this very bombastic. Well, I mean, I'm actually the opposite. Cause if you think about what they talk about later in the movie is if they're not doing those mundane things, the danger that can occur, uh, as we saw later with that one plane <laughs> that gets stuck on the runway, uh, so it's it's it was I I really just I, I like I personally it's like one of my favorite opening montages from a movie that I've seen in recent you know years, uh, not in recent years I'm sorry but like I think of I think of like of all movies th- that are not epics that's one of my favorite opening sequences because uh, something about that music with the imagery it it kind it it kind of does make what like what his wife says you're just, all you're doing is running an airport but it kind of does takes the money stuff and kinds of give it sort of a heroic quality so that's kind of why I've, i disagree with you on the fact that the music and what's being shown is mismatched um but i do i am glad that we at least both agree on the fact that this is not necessarily a disaster movie it's a drama with disaster elements <laughs> exactly i don't think that this really especially with what came later especially like they kept making it bigger and bigger like poseidon was one thing then earthquake it was like oh no this you know like it doesn't a building collapse or something and then uh inferno like they kept making the the disaster grander and grander until it just got in fact i think that's kind of what killed off the genre i think is it got to the point where it was so ridiculous people stopped taking it seriously yeah and then that's what drew people in when it sort of reemerged in the 2000s with people like Roland Emmerich making like 2012 and the Day the Earth Stops Living or you know. Like, well, the Day <laughs> the Earth Stood Still was a was a sci fi movie. I know, it's not. I, I know. I'm not. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just making a title up in that case. Like that's, yeah, I, that I, wasn't I got Roland you. Emmerich either. I'm talking. <laughs> you know who? Uh, Independence Day. For Thank instance. you. Yeah. Like. But he kind of he made disaster movies, but he made them in the like after CGI was popularized, mm-hmm. and his were like so over the top. Um, and he's still making them. Speaking <laughs> but, uh, of CGI, one of the things that I like about this is the snow, particularly when they're in the tower. It's you know, it's that it's obviously that super fake like sixties snow that's way too big, and you can tell there's somebody off screen just throwing a bucket of it like onto a fan, but there's just something about it that is just so nostalgic that I I just love it. I love I love how dramatically fake it looks. <laughs> you know, I actually wonder. Like, I didn't think we would ever look at this, but you know, like. You might actually really like Die Hard too, because it takes place at an airport, <laughs> right? And I, I actually, my mom told me about this that one because that's the one. I think there's a again there there's I think there's like a suicide bomber on a plane, right? And they can't 
leave no, the airport no. they can't um, land I'm, like in case in case we do review it in the future i'm not you know i won't reveal but like it is actually a pretty interesting uh predicament that they're in uh but it's also like <clears throat> i think it's like it takes place a year later on christmas mm-hmm. um and it's at an airport and pretty much like the thing is that the airport's going about its business and john mcclain knows that there are terrorists and no one believes him mm-hmm. and the airport security guy is like kind of the bad guy in the movie because he keeps getting in his way like oh you're crazy there's there's nothing bad going on here i do know Stu- that, that you 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 stop a terrorist <laughs> attack in in los angeles once and you think you're a hero you know i don't know i feel like just based on the sort of movies you tend to like and especially if you like this movie i feel like you might even like die hard 2 more than the first movie <laughs> well i do know that i do know that at least the bat the bag the airport guy you keep talking about is played by an actor named dennis franz who was the lead yeah. in nypd blue for like years um yep, yep. so i know him, but so we're getting to sort of that part of the of the podcast where it's time to you know to put in our final thoughts i don't think I'll, I'll still give my thoughts but i don't think i need to at this point but what was your overall just like impression so i did like it um i don't know if i'm really gonna go back and revisit it if you're like if we're ever hanging out and you want to put it on i wouldn't necessarily um object as far as like recommending it the problem is like it almost feels like a movie where like you know like it did if i really like something but i kind of have a feeling it's just like a me thing and i don't think like it's necessarily like got wide appeal like i wouldn't necessarily recommend it to someone and that's kind of the thing. Like, I, I don't know what the, do any of you listening, like, I don't know what your ages are. I don't know if it's, uh, like, classic movie fans or anything like that. But this, it doesn't, it's not a disaster movie. It's very long. It's, um, <clears throat> it's a little bit slow paced. Um, and it's very melodramatic, almost to the point of it feeling kind of like a two hour, like, soap opera. So, like, I can't recommend it necessarily to disaster movie fans. Um, And in a lot of ways, it feels very dated. I talked about that at the beginning of the review with like, I can recommend Poseidon Adventure to people today because even though it is an old movie, like it is very exciting and it doesn't feel very old. This movie doesn't have that timeless quality. Like, and that's part of what makes you like it so much is that it is very much like a time capsule of the time it came out. Yeah. Um, what things I like about it, I do like the screenwriting. I think that it comes together nicely. I think the editing is outstanding. Uh, I think that is the best thing in the movie, honestly. I think a lot of the characters are very likable. But all of that being said, it's not something I think has like a very wide appeal. Like I feel like if a lot of uh, like your average movie going fans like were watching it i don't know if they'd have the same like attachment to it as you would and i definitely don't think young people would like this i think if you put this in <laughs> I'm front old. of zoomer in front of this movie they would get so bored yeah um and again that's like i'm br- i'm comparing it to the poseidon adventure because that is one that i feel like people have forgotten about even though it's really good but i feel like if it were rediscovered i don't know someone plays a clip on tiktok or something i feel like there could be a resurgence because i do feel like that movie has like a timeless quality to it this it's very niche Mm -hmm. so for that reason i kind of like i hate to say i'm giving it a pass because again i didn't i didn't dislike this i thought it was a fine movie but like i i don't know very many people who i can really truly recommend it to you know what Got i mean it. like I, I i i it's very niche and i don't know that many people who would really find this super appealing unless they are super patient like i i can definitely say if you sit for like the the equivalent amount of time of a of a full movie it will eventually get exciting and it will eventually will have a very nice payoff but for just a general like movie person i feel like most people probably wouldn't find this as exciting as when it came out right and that's all that's all very fair and valid I'm actually going to backtrack just one quick se- <laughs> for, I'm going to come back in my thing, but there's one other no thing worries. I kind of wanted to get your opinion on. And I totally just blanked on this. The ending of the, one of my favorite sequences is the ending when they're trying to land and we just keep getting 
updates from the tower of, okay, you're this many feet away. And then they keep looking out the window and they're not seeing anything and it's just silent. And they keep going back and then they find, and they finally, after a few times looking out the windows, looking back out the windows, we finally get to see the lights. There's something about the way that's constructed. And especially if you were to see that sort of on a big screen, in my opinion, when you're just seeing just out the airplane, the front of the, the air, the airplane windshield, and you're kind of getting that experience like you're almost there. There's something to me that I'm like, and I've, and I've, and I want to see if you agree. I just feel like the tension that's created there is almost perfect. Cause like, you know, there it's, it's weird. It's like, you know, they're going to land, you know, it's going to be okay. But the way that it's created, you can feel the tension of the pilots. Not exactly quite sure how this is going to play out. <laughs> There's a reason I said the editing was outstanding. It's not just in the, like, uh, the, like cross or bleh, the the side panels mm-hmm. you know what i was talking about. oh yeah it's also like they have a lot of coverage of the airplane and they do that thing where i think they call it like time extension where it's like oh we have a minute on the clock but it goes on for like five minutes yeah. in actual play time and they've got like they keep cutting back to the tail like is it gonna break off they you know so it's 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 in the editing honestly mm-hmm. like that and that's the thing i don't think this movie has fantastic cinematography i don't think it's bad i think it's probably pretty good for the time and there's some really memorable shots like that opening montage even though i'm not a big fan of the score paired with it i agree with you i think it's a really well constructed title sequence yeah um and i feel like a lot of the editing does sort of the heavy lifting for the moderate cinematography again it's not bad but it's not necessarily like out there's not like a shot in the movie that really stands out in my mind as being really interesting um although i will say uh knowing that it was in 70 millimeter thinking of the widescreen i was like watching on on like when i was watching this i think it would actually be really nice in a giant 70 millimeter oh yeah uh, screen the other i this was something i was thinking of jokingly when i was uh because i didn't know if this did well at the box office or not but you know like i was going to jokingly say you know why poseidon did better at the box office (laughs) why because it had that hit song (laughs) oh yeah there's got to to be be a a morning morning after after. (laughs) you want to take your movie to the next level get 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 a platinum hit they did that suddenly that movie is going to be a million times more successful you know that's why they did it in 75 with the singing nun (laughs) exactly that's why they had the singing nun they're like oh you we've got a whole album to promote as well right yeah well just but yeah so like i i i guess like going back to again i kind of have to give it a pass but not again because i think it's a bad movie it's just i really don't know who i can recommend this to right for a lot of reasons and i'd like even before you explained a lot of the other things things you liked about this movie i knew that it appeals to a lot of things you like you tend to like disaster movies because of that uh sort of the group coming together against all odds yeah a lot of movies we've watched where that's like a big selling point for you and i do again like that i think would appeal to a lot of people the problem is you have to sit for like two hours to get to that right because yeah because like we because so much of that it comes in the last like 20 minutes of the movie and it again it's it's paying off like so much of what you've sat through but it is so long to get there and you have to sit through a lot of like it, it was actually nice to hear that you agreed with me that some of the storylines you don't find is engaging because right. i was just like if it wasn't burt lancaster or joe or like i was just like i don't care about these people <laughs> like, <laughs> like just I, and again i know i keep touching this i just want to finish my thought on that one um that 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 sequence I was talking about. Just we do we so we go back and forth between the clouds. We finally get a shot of the runway when it comes into view, and the music comes in right there. And it also sounds like for a quick second, it's like magical, and then it goes into the the tension, the the typical tension sounding music. And I love that because it's like because like as the audience, you're like, oh, it's over. Oh no, it's not. They still have to actually land. <laughs> and it's there's something about that, but. As you guys can probably tell, I'm going to give this one a large recommend. I will agree with what Whiskey says a lot. For most of today's audiences, it will probably, they'd probably think this was either bad or a past movie. In fact, there was even a contemporary review I read of it of somebody who I disagree with her on this, but she said, you know, it was one stereotyped action followed by stereotype reaction. My argument against that is, well, this is the movie that kind of invented a lot of the stereotypes. So you can't really 
fault it for that. It's like I had a friend who saw Murder on the Orient Express and complained that the he's seen the he's seen endings like that a million times. I'm like, well, this story invented that ending, so you can't really fault it for that. But well, hopefully that friend at least liked the original. I haven't seen the remake mostly because it's like. I like the remake. I mean, the, the original, like, and it's been made, like, two times before the most recent one, so it's kind of like, I don't know, should I just watch the one that, whatever, anyway, the, but, it, but going back to, I think, like, part of, part of what I think is good about these reviews is not just, you know, whether we care, like, whether you care what we think of the movie or whatever, but if you've sat through this whole over an hour like <laughs> review and any of this sounds appealing to you well then congratulations you're the person you're the small percentage i can actually recommend this movie <laughs> to just like as a general thing i don't think i can really say like oh you're gonna love this if you see it it's again for a very like specific type of person i think this movie would be very exciting and popular and everything but just in general i feel like most people would find this boring yeah and probably wouldn't you know i <laughs> to be honest if i hadn't been watching this for this review and it was on tv or something i probably would have gotten bored of it <laughs> uh but i'm glad i sat through it. it again like if if you can make it through the ending is worth it it just takes so much patience <laughs> Well, all good things are worth waiting for, as we like to say. I think it's a movie that's incredibly beautiful in the way that it's the the way that it's the editing has been chosen, the stylistic choices they've made, the costume choice, the music choices. It, like in like in like whiskey has said, it probably is not for everybody nowadays. It was at the time it came out, but like he said, filmmaking and techniques have advanced since then, because even though this came out in the 70s, it feels very much like a 1965 movie. But if you could give it a chance, I think you will be pleasantly surprised at how it goes, except I will say this, about Burt Lancaster. I know I said I love his character. I hate his last line where they're like, oh, let's go to breakfast. And he and she's like, oh, where? He's like, well, you've been to your house. You've been <laughs> you've been talking about your scrambled eggs. I'm like, boy, I just had a very difficult evening. I do not want to be making scrambled eggs now. <laughs> but I want to I, <laughs> I want to end- use some product placement. Oh, why don't we hit up IHOP? Right. I hop in 24 hours. <laughs> let's, let's go to let's go to the pig stand. That's an old restaurant that has been around forever. But I want to close out um, my my recommend with this quote from the New York Times by a uh, Vincent Camby wrote wrote about this movie for the New York Times. And he said in his uh, review, Airport, the film version of Arthur Haley's novel, is the sort of movie most people mean when they say Hollywood doesn't make movies the way it used to. This isn't just because Airport resembles any number of grand hotel movies. Rather, it's because it evokes our nostalgic feelings, not only for the innocence of old movies, but also for the innocent old times in which we saw them. So that is what I find it funny that that is exactly my biggest criticism. <laughs> like what I said at the beginning, how Poseidon feels timeless and this feels like a piece of history. Yeah. <laughs> and part of the reason I don't think a lot of people would like it. It's, it's uh, you know, it's not bad, but I don't think it has wide appeal. The yeah. way, you know, but with that very romantic and poetic sending off, um, we want to remember that you guys like and subscribe. Hit that notification bell if you're on YouTube. Please hit us up if you uh, if you're still caring about that giveaway we talked about. Oh my god! If it hasn't been claimed already, I don't know. <laughs> if it hasn't, we'll see. I'm curious if that's even going to get claimed by anybody. But uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out with you guys. It's always fun. And next movie should be very exciting very it's exciting also, and probably oh yeah. one that most of you will actually be able to sit through <laughs> yeah and also probably that a bunch of you have probably already seen but until then stay thirsty guys reels on the rocks is a production of la prince laboratories it is edited and produced by Alejandro Castillo and features original artwork by Ace Esparza and original music by Pat Mars. Follow us on Twitter at Reels on the Rocks and tweet at us with any movies or topics you'd like us to discuss in the future.